it will be available on the same on our website starting next Wednesday. So you can look out for that. So we are so thankful to our presenters and for all of you for your time. We encourage you to attend as many ses sessions as you'd like, and you can visit our website for the full session schedule. Everyone who attends a session is entered to win a t-shirt and water bottle, and you will be emailed if you are a winner. So the more sessions you attend, the more chances you have to win. And so a couple of items before we get started. Um, I did mention that the session is being recorded um, and we just ask that you keep yourself muted um, unless there's an opportunity to unmute yourself. But we do encourage you to use the chat for questions or comments. So I'd love to introduce you to Taylor Mullins. So Taylor works for Rowan University as the Assistant Director of Aquatics and Risk Management for Campus Recreation. By trade, she is a recreation professional, but her passion and interest lies within fitness, wellness, and social justice. She teaches for Temple University's Kinesiology Physical Activity Program as an adjunct professor, professor is a cycle instructor. Some of you may have taken her class today. Um, a certified personal trainer and amateur bodybuilder and leads her department's diversity, equity, and inclusivity initiatives. Taylor is excited to share with you how her passion and interests intersect and the ways in which we can dismantle the systems of white supremacy, how they show up in our day-to-day -day lives, and how we can work together to celebrate and liberate all bodies. So Taylor, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks so much, Katie, and um, welcome to everybody. I'm I'm um, feeling very, very grateful to have this opportunity to be able to present um, something that I have found so, so interesting over the last six months or so. Um, my, again, like uh, Katie had mentioned, my name is Taylor and I use she, her pronouns. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you all about body liberation a journey towards understanding diet culture, its deep roots of white supremacy and how we can dismantle fat phobia. I do want to recognize that I am um, privileged. I live in a thin, able body, um, but I do identify as a black woman. So I am part of our marginalized um, communities. Um, I do want to also note that I don't know everything about feminism um, or anti-racism work. Um, I still am learning and still on my journey. I don't have any formal academic training on this topic, but I have been reading, watching, unlearning, and relearning. Um, so I am just here to um, be committed to learning, to growing, to sharing, and to amplify others. Um, I do want to say that I think it's super important um, that we do amplify the voices of Black and Brown um, women that um, take up larger bodies um, who started this body liberation movement. Um, and I'll go into that in, um, in a few slides at the towards the end of my presentation. So thanks so much everybody for being here. All right, Katie. Okay, sorry. Um, so I do want to make mention, um, that I do have a trigger warning here. Um, so we are going to be discussing dieting, body size, and body image. Um, this is prevalent throughout the presentation. Um, and these topics discussed are not meant to be medical advice. Um, so if you are feeling triggered, um, feel free to leave. Um, and you can, you know, refer back to the presentation at another time, um, but also encourage you to please speak to your personal doctor or nutritionist. I did want to provide some resources here on campus. Um, if something, some things do come up, um, feel free to, you have the opportunity right now to just take a quick picture, um, but I did want to make mention of that. All right. So, now is an opportunity for us to be a little interactive, um, whether it be in the chat or you feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I wanted to start off this presentation um, with just a few words that come up when we think about, you know, health and fitness. So when we think about um, words and images, um, when we think about diet, health, wellness, and fitness, I just want you to kind of take the time to think quietly um, and then throw some um, ideas in the chat or you can unmute yourself as what images what words um, do you associate with diet, health, wellness, and fitness? Self-care. Oh, I love that positive one. Goals. Okay. Self-care. Goals. Body image. Yes. Thin. Cleanse. Okay. Yep. We get into some cleanses. All right. 
what types of um, people do we think about when we think about diet, health, wellness, and fitness? Attractive folks, strong strength. Then again, health instructors, lean. Great, so yeah, so I mean, I'm surprised at some of your um, responses that they're more positive than the first time that I um, presented this here. Um, so I appreciate that. It means that we're shifting, that we're growing. Um, that the industry is changing. Um, but as we head into this next slide, when I did a quick Google search of the words, you know, health, fitness, wellness, um, I saw a lot of in images of, again, thin, strong, strong, lean, um, white women. Um, there are a few women of color um, kind of on the, on the um, <clears throat> screen here. So they were the anomaly to my search. But I do want to take a moment to kind of explore some of the biases we have around these words, such as fitness, wellness, health, um, and diet. So generally speaking, um, the diet industry um, has an overrepresentation of thin white women. Um, and these show up on magazine covers, in movies, on your Instagram feed, in fitness videos. Um, and we generally feel as though um, fitness, wellness, health, um, diet, culture um, are not inclusive spaces, right? So, um, when we think back about how we grew up um, and how we've been conditioned um, in these spaces is that, you know, Barbie dolls, the TV shows that you watched, um, the places that you might shop, um, social media might make you feel as though thin and lean is better, that um, white is right, right? And if you don't identify as either, um, that places might not be a space for you. So I can think of, um, a couple of places that I frequented um, as a fitness fitness buff within Philadelphia that, you know, Philly's a pretty diverse, um, diverse city, but, you know, I walk into the Lululemon um, in Center City on, on Walnut Street, and that space has become very, very white. You think about Soul Cycle. Um, do you see any instructors or other folks in that space that look like you? Um, also, to not to mention, you know, yoga spaces. I know Katie and I have had conversations about yoga spaces. Um, being very, very white woman centered. So that's just something that I wanted you to consider as we headed um, down this presentation. So I'm going to be a little vulnerable here. Um, on this slide, you see a handful of pictures that I had to um, kind of dig up in the vault, right? So on the left-hand side, I'm set in the middle in my uh, gold and blue soccer jersey and my sister and I are in the middle there. Um, we were on a cruise that year. Oops. Katie's getting excited. We were on a cruise that year. And on the other picture you see, you see me again on the top right um, on, the, on the second row um, standing up. So you wonder why um, I, why did, why did I choose this, this topic? Um, and I think, you know, these, my childhood really, really um, shaped how I look at my body and how I felt in my body, whether it was as an adult or even growing up. Um, so I had all of these internalized beliefs um, from a very, very early age that smaller was better, um, that thinness was better. Um, I grew up in a very white centered space in the suburbs of Portland, Oregon. So um, my mother was white. Um, she was always dieting. Um, she was always buying fat free everything. Oreos, you know, in the 90s, that was very, very um, popular, fat free everything. So I remember that as a, as a woman in her 30s, what my mom used to buy as a child. And that really had shaped, you know, how I viewed food and what food was good food and what food was bad food, even at eight. You know, you can see here, um, my schoolmates and I playing soccer. I played with those girls since I was a little itty bitty girl, but you can see that as I looked very different than everybody, you know? So all of my friends were small, white, blonde girls, right? Um, I used to get teased and co was called fat by my crush on the last day of fifth grade. So all of these tiny, tiny little, you know, I think we can call them sometimes microaggressions or things that we internalize really add up and shape who we are. 
Um, growing up, my grandmother would um, may, always make comments about my weight. So I had from these moments, all of these internalized feelings of anti-fatness, which in turn becomes these feelings of anti-blackness, which I didn't even realize were happening um, literally until about six months ago. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, and as I progressed, my journey in high school, I had slimmed down, but I still never fit because I was this black body in these white spaces. Um, in college, I felt more comfortable and more accepted, but it really wasn't until I was an actual adult where I really started to um, internalize and become triggered about my body and how I showed up in spaces. Um, and I can, you know, Instagram, was getting really popular when I was in my mid twenties. And I saw all of these fitness women, you know, competing in bodybuilding competitions and being very small. So I was like, oh my goodness, I can do that. That's going to be a challenge. Um, when deep down inside, I didn't really want to do that. I just wanted to figure out how to change my body. Um, and so I was successful in that a handful of times, um, but at what cost, you know? So I spent the last about five years of my, of my life um, really weighing everything I ate, I ate, excuse me, count, counted and tracked every bite of food that went into my mouth. I spent over two hours a day in the gym, six days a week. I didn't have any social life, um, but there was a goal in mind, of course. I wanted to compete on a stage, but at what cost? So um, that transitions me into my light bulb moment that I had back in June. Yeah, so my light bulb moment, right? Um, so I remember specifically what day it was because I can go back into my social media and find Lauren Lavelle's post. Um, so that was me on the right. Um, Oprah went on June 4th in 2020 after I read what Lauren Lavelle had posted. She had mentioned that diet culture is the stumbling block for social justice. It is hard to do this work if you are solely focused on shrinking yourself. So that hit me at a couple of different angles. At the time I had just, um, just got done competing in, in my bodybuilding and I was so focused on you know maintaining this small tiny physique and this was had just happened this post came out right after the death of George Floyd. And I remember in this moment that I wasn't focused on like what I was eating or worried about how many macros and macronutrients or grams was weighed um, in the food that I was eating. I was so focused on becoming a better, you know, anti-racist um, social justice warrior in those spaces. Um, so that was kind of the moment for me. And I want to make mention that I still have a lot of unpacking to do and unlearning to do and relearning to do. Um, I'm nowhere, you know, I'm not perfect, um, but I enjoy challenging myself, my biases, um, and how I feel as though I should show up in the world, especially as a fitness professional, especially as a Black woman, um, as a fitness professional. And if anybody doesn't know of Lauren Lavelle, she is a Philadelphia-based body positive trainer and coach. Um, she's super, super active with on social media. So um, there, you can take a quick picture or write her name down. Um, so if you're on Facebook or on Instagram, I highly encourage you to follow her. So I do want to get into the nitty gritty and I want to recognize um, and let you all know that this is just barely brushing the surface. Um, I have some resources at the end um, if this is interesting to you. So I'm going to just talk to you briefly about the racial origins of fat phobia and nobody should feel upset or ashamed um, that they didn't know about this because this isn't spoken about, you know. Um, so Initially, during the Renaissance period, larger full figured bodies were valued, right? We saw those in paintings. We knew that, you know, if you were a larger body, that meant that you were wealthy, that you had food, um, that you had all of these resources. So the idea and desire to be thin originated during the African slave trade in tandem with the Enlightenment period during the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so at this time, European philosophers took notice um, that the slave of the slaves during the slave trade and how they were, you know, overly indulgent, um, both with sex and with food. Um, so at this time, in order for Europeans to be the superior race of the world, they had to separate themselves from the African slaves. So by doing that, um, men, whether they were scientists or philosophers, began to equate thinness with restraint, 
with logic, with rationale, and the ability to control your appetite. Um, so for this, this meant that um, European women had to stay slim in order to show Christian Protestant nature and racial support, superiority, while blackness was associated with laziness, stupidity, and fatness, because these women, um, these slave women showed up in larger bodies, which in fact could mean fuller breasts, thighs, hips, butt, bellies. Thanks, Katie, <laughs> sorry. So, um, as we transition, there uh, is, you know, anti-fatness in our current modern medicine. And so I'll just briefly review the history of BMI. It was actually made by an astronomer who decided that, you know, white European uh, people were representative of the entire population because at that time, um, Black folks were not considered considered humans. Um, so he made these rigid categories of, of underweight, overweight, obese. Um, the measurement of weight, the BMI is the measurement of weight to height ratio, um, and this doesn't have any consideration of whether or not what your bone density is, um, muscularity, or other genetic or cultural influences. Um, so now as we've trans, um, transitioned into 2021, we're still using the BMI to measure health and to measure wellness. And I mean, it affects what type of insurance you can get, what type of life insurance you can get. Um, and so if we, are, if we are thinking that way still, um, Black women generally tend to be show up in larger bodies. So four out of five Black women are considered to be overweight according to BMI standards. And so what type of, what effect does that have on them when they are trying to get life insurance or health insurance? Um, how does that affect their experiences when they go to the doctor? Um, so we have, we put the BMI, this measurement, um, on a pedestal, but it has so many lasting effects um, that can impact so many areas of black and brown folks' lives. Um, so when we, when we talk about the BMI um, scale, it was never originally intended to be used um, for individual fatness. That's what wasn't, we weren't supposed to use that as a measurement. So um, as we transition from, um, you know, the transatlantic slave trade, and we briefly mentioned BMI, um, I want to talk to you all about, you know, fat phobia, weight bias, and weight stigma, and how um, that has come about from our history and the origins, right? So um, fat phobia is the intense fear or dislike of fatness, um, becoming fat, and fat bodies. Um, so this negative rhetoric surrounds fatness and obesity today solely from the racist roots of white supremacy. White people want to prove that they are superior to Black people through their size. Um, so this means a slim body is a more privileged than a larger body. Um, I had mentioned that I have a privilege, this thin privilege. So I want you all to kind of start to think about how, you know, your biases might show up when we think about thinness and we think about fatness. Um, the ability to control weight through diet and exercise is seen as a moral pursuit because people are able to control their own natural instincts and nourishment. So we, we think back to, you know, when we've all gone on a diet or we have all um, exercise and we start to lose pounds. Maybe, you know, you're trying to get your summer body ready for your bikini for your vacation and how much, you know, how much pride do you have um, when you've lost those extra pounds or when people, you know, um, celebrate you for, oh my goodness, you look so good. You've lost all this weight. Well, this makes us, this gives us this intrinsic, you know, these factors that we're so proud, you know, so it's this pursuit that, you know, if I can restrict, if I can say no to this piece of cake or be no to, you know, not exercising, um, that I'm going to be, you know, better than folks that, that don't exercise or do eat the cake. Um, so these, and this has really impacted our systems of white supremacy. Um, we have standardized these bodies. Um, a thin body is measure is a measurement of your proximity to whiteness. Again, that thin ideal, um, anti-fat bias shows up in the workplace within romantic relationships and in medical situations, like I had mentioned with the BMI. Um, and then 
additional impacts of white supremacy um, really affects black and brown communities and their access um, to food, to healthy food. Um, we talk about the lack of um, BIPOC dietitians. So there's a reason why, you know, dietitians have to have an in unpaid internship for X amount of hours and some folks can't afford to not get paid for X amount of hours. So there's these systems in place that really, really structure what diet culture looks like, what wellness looks like, what, you know, being, being in a smaller body looks like. Um, and so we also, you know, can talk about um, the demonization of cultural foods. How many times did we hear in, you know, 2010 that white rice was bad for you, right? That avocados had too much fat, but now, you know, folks are eating quinoa and using turmeric and eating avocados and eating plantains and they're now trendy. So this cultural appropriation of food as well. Um, and also to, you know, go, uh, go off of, you know, we're talking about black and brown bodies, this untreated um, eating disorders within BIPOC communities, because um, eating disorders are, you know, part of a mental, mental health um, issue. And, you know, mental health sometimes is not, you know, supported within the, within the black and brown communities. There's also limited um, resources to black and brown um black and brown therapists. So there's these cycles and these roadblocks in place for, you know, folks that identify um, within the BIPOC community to not fully be 100% successful in their health and their wellness journey because there's roadblocks. So as we come out of the history, I do want to um, bring light to the liberation. Um, so we hear about, you know, body positivity, body loving your body, body acceptance, but I really would love folks to move towards this liberation. Um, and body liberation is, a, you know, a freedom from all outside expectations, right? We don't have to love our bodies um, all of the time. Um, we're not asking for permission to be included on society's ideal of beauty. Um, Body liber liberation is recognizing the systemic issues that surround us and acknowledge that we cannot fix them all on our own. And it's also personally giving ourselves permission to live life, okay? So I want you to sit with those and, and think about your journey to body liberation. And I mean, it's not going to get covered within the next three or four minutes, um, but to start exploring how, you know, the things that I've shared about the history of, of fat phobia and, and racism um, and how that might currently affect how you see yourself. Um, and, and body, body liberation does go beyond just body image. It's these power systems that make it difficult for marginalized bodies, whether they're fat, black, brown, indigenous, trans, gay, um, to feel safe in their own bodies. Um, but I do want to make mention when we talk about liberation, we must understand um, the key components to the body liberation movement is um, two part of your anti blackness work. So if you are going to be liberated, if you are going to be body positive, um, you also need to um, work on your anti blackness, you need to become an anti racist. Um, we also must acknowledge the labor of black and brown women and femmes who continue to do the work liberating all bodies. Um, these folks are the ones that have trailblazed um, for body love, self-acceptance and self-love. Um, it's, it's super trendy to have body love right now or body positivity, um, but this is often um, found within um, area within fitness professionals who are thin and white, who generally center themselves and amplify, amplify themselves um, and their journey, which in turn, you know, just glorifies what it means to be a thin cis white woman. So the failure to name their privilege and those who fought for the access and benefits of body liberation. So these women who, you know, are body, you know, body positivity, you know, social media um, influencers oftentimes don't recognize the folks that have paved the way for them um, to even have that platform and have that space. So I ask you is, you know, is it truly self-love if it is anti-Black? Can you truly be body positive, body positive if you are an anti-fat and anti-Black 
um, if you have those, if you have those feelings. So, you know, this is the time where, like I had said, I've had to unlearn and relearn, um, just giving you little gems here and there to kind of think about um, as you progress through your journey and, and do some learning on your own. So um, I say all of that to say, um, how can you be a part of this movement? Um, I really, really encourage everybody to elevate and um, center marginalized voices who are already doing this work. Um, those that are out there dismantling these systems of oppression within the fitness industry, wellness industry, and diet industry. Um, so by, by doing that, you know, you update your social media feeds. Um, I think representation is everything. Um, and it's, and I have found that social media, especially during within the last year has become such an educational tool. Um, so even if you're not on social media, I encourage you to just create just a blank Instagram profile, um, just to learn because there are so many resources out there. Um, I want to recognize that we are, you know, consciously and unconsciously influenced by diet culture, um, by racism and the intersection between the two. So, you know, learning where the thin ideal belief is rooted, we can then unlearn and relearn, um, much like we're doing um, here today together. Um, I encourage you to challenge your biases and take the next, um, take the test on Project Implicit, that's through Harvard. Um, to measure your beliefs about body size. There is one specific um, to body size. And you know, we're, we're not perfect. And you know, there will be some opportunity, there will be some times where you stumble, but you need to kind of acknowledge that, you know, be like, all right, I'm going to do better and then continue to push through, you know, it's not going to be smooth sailing. And you know, you'll sit there and catch yourself in moments where, but, but I think it's important to just be really cognizant of that. Um, I, you know, activism is also disrupting the patterns, the systems, and having conversations that play into diet culture and hurt marginalized groups. So, you know, you are with your family and your friends say X, Y, and Z. Are you that person that's going to step up and say something back and respond? Um, so, you know, it takes, it takes some, some time for you to be uncomfortable in those spaces, but to really, you know, be an activist, it's, it's required of you to be a disruptor as well. Um, and then I also, you know, we talked about friends and family. I think it's an opportunity for you to create awareness and begin the conversations with friends and family. Um, I think that's a, a really safe, comfortable space to start. Um, and then as you get more and more comfortable in those spaces, then, you know, you can you can step out and start speaking, speaking louder with, with folks outside of your group about what it means to, um, you know, have this be a body, be body positive, have a liberated body and, you know, how you can, you know, um, be an activist in this movement. So they are a little small. I hope you can see that, but I just wanted to share a few um, resources with you. Um, just a few social media accounts that I follow. Um, you know, Chrissy King is awesome. Um, Lauren Lavelle, I had mentioned before. Um, Mo Motivate, Nalvana Body Positivity. Um, we've got Black and Embodied, and I am Ivy Felicia. So again, amplifying the voices of Black and Brown women who have paved the way, who are doing the work. Um, they, a handful of them, you know, I know Chrissy King for a fact, um, Nalgana Positivity Pride, Mo Motivate, all do, um, do webinars and trainings. Um, so, you know, there is a, there is a cost to them, but, you know, we are in the day and age where we pay black women. So this is a space for, you know, you to give back and be part of, you know, part of supporting black women, but also learning, um, in turn, um, fearing the black body is what really, um, motivated me. I think, you know, oh, in the summertime, I listened to some Chrissy King, um, on a podcast and then it kind of, uh, snowballed into, I, I heard something from Sabrina Strings, who is the author of Fearing the Black Body. She was on a podcast with, and I bought the book. And so it, you know, once you follow one person, it kind of is a trickle down effect. So then you can, like I said, switch up your social media feed to really follow these folks that are, that are in the trenches and really um, bringing light to something that we don't think about, you know? So I really appreciate everybody um, 
being here, taking the time um, to listen. I hope this was insightful. Um, I, you know, like I had said, I'm no expert, but I hope this was an opportunity, you know, for just to shine some light on something you might not have thought about. So thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions or comments. Not sure if I'll be able to answer them, but I'm here. <laughs> So yes, thank you so much, Taylor. And wanted to see, it looks like Kevin um, has posted, uh, put some of the Instagram um, sites that you mentioned. So if anybody wants to check those out, but does anybody at this point have a question, any questions for Taylor? All right. Well, Taylor, I have to say thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. You gave us so much to think about um, and challenge us, um, especially when it comes to health and wellness and what we think about when it comes to uh, fitness, health, wellness, and anti-racism anti and how um, we could keep showing up and continue to learn. So thank you so much. I especially love the, the, the photos of you as a kid that was really nice of course thank you everybody yes. for the time and the space yeah and 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 before we go just a reminder we still have sessions um this evening we have a few more sessions this evening um for, from the expo we have sessions uh tomorrow and uh thursday as well i think i see abigail here here who is is teaching um, a yoga for all session on thursday morning but please do check out our sessions i'll put the link to um, our website in the chat. And then also please check out the Rowan Thrive website that goes through all the different dimensions of well being. Um, and you can also check out prof links for different resources, um, programs, and services throughout Rowan's campus um, that you can keep uh, looking and learning towards. I hope you all have a wonderful night. And um, thanks again for being here. Appreciate you all. Thanks so much, Taylor. Have a good night, everybody. Okay, let me stop recording.